so our next speaker, um, Dietrich Klinghart, um, he is, of course, internationally known for his successful treatment of chronic pain and illness. Um, Dr. Klinghart combines non-surgical orthopedic medicine with immunology, endocrinology, toxicology, neural therapy, hypnotherapy, and energy psychology. His unique approach to diagnosing and treating diseases and disorders on both the physical and mental emotional levels recognizes that good health is dependent upon a well-functioning autonomic nervous system, a healthy mind that creates a balanced emotional state, a supportive network of relationships within current and past generations of the family. His teaching includes explorations of the influence of family relationships on health based on approaches developed by psychoanalyst Bert Hellinger. Dr. Klinghart will be discussing HPU, um, which I'm not going to even try to do the real long word of it, he's going to do it, um, in Lyme disease and autism. So give him a warm welcome. Um, how many of you were here last year at the at Tammy's conference? Okay, so you know, some of us feel that um, this idea that autism uh, may be congenitally acquired Lyme disease is making white circles across the world and stirring up a lot of moms and a lot of researchers. And so far, everybody who's tried to disprove the idea has proven that it's actually true that probably around 80% of autistic children test, when you test long enough in good enough labs and you do the testing right, test positive that they are in fact effect, infected uh, with Borrelia or with one of the co-infections. And if you find anywhere in medicine a chronic illness that has a certain name and find one particular species of bacteria, um, every, everywhere else in medicine that link is made and then it is called an infectious disease. The only exception anywhere in the world is autism. Yeah? So the rules that apply to any illness anywhere in the world don't apply to autism. Why that is, um, Doris was hinting in that direction, has to do with politics and uh, money and probably also a lot of ego amongst the professors that didn't discover it first. You know, when you look at it and Tammy discovered it first, it can't be true. But all of us who've been looking at it long enough um, found it to be true. Uh, me and Amy, uh, Amy Dirksen, who also uh, is, is a close friend, uh, she's a naturopathic doctor who worked with me years ago. Uh, we did a trial run on our autistic children in the practice and we tested the first 10 kids and eight of them tested right off the bat positive in the Western blood test, IgM positive for Borrelia. This was just a random test on it and that number hasn't changed since then. And we know in adult Lyme patients that we are dreaming one day we get there where we can make actually the diagnosis with the Western blood test in 80% of the people. Meaning that in a 100% in a community of Lyme patients that have the illness, we can only find the bug based on the Western blood test in 80%. What I'm saying with this implicitly, I would not be surprised in a few years if the number in autism goes up to the 100% which well, I feel it, it truly is. And so um, I do think this is a huge issue. It's not a small, it's not just one more thing, not one more thing to consider after the methylation cycle, but I do feel it should be the first thing to be considered. And so I have the fortune that my practice is split in the middle, so half my patients are adult Lyme patients and half the patients are autistic children. And I've learned the treatment of autistic children by using my adult Lyme population as my guinea pigs. They were my guinea pigs doing all the experiments and we were looking there what works and what doesn't work. I've been doing Lyme now for ever since Chris Hasser, who sits here, Chris, show yourself. Chris um, is a witness that he introduced me to Lyme disease in 1992. Um, he was already Lyme literate. He was one of the first Lyme literate physicians 
in the not only in the country but in the world. I don't know how he got there, but I mean, Chris was always, yeah, yeah, he's hooked up in a different way. One of those. Chris is both uh, an osteopath and a, and a dentist, and um, also like the best cavitation surgery guy in the country or in the world. Anyway, so we worked together for a year, and I started uh, based on his urging me looking for Lyme disease and people we used uh, at the time uh, uh, energetic testing but used real Borrelia cultures and we found in my chronic pain population a huge amount of uh, patients who were testing positive for Lyme long before Lyme disease even had a name you know I mean it, it, it you know come 2000 something or so everybody is on everybody's mouth you know like it's a new candida or the new herpes type 6 uh, now it's, you know, Lyme disease, but it was always underlying those other illnesses. And so I learned on my, my adult Lyme patients how to treat them and what to look for in terms of the biochemistry, in terms of the nutrition, uh, in terms of the antimicrobial regime. We realized that you can never get a Lyme patient well unless you start with detoxification. That needs to be step number one. And that brought me close to the group of Bill Ray and the Environmental Medicine Group and Doris Rapp uh, by realizing you can really never get anybody well from anything unless you address the, the toxic field in which I exist. And I included the family and the family dynamics uh, into that and watched out for that very carefully. So we do all the things that environmental medicine is about. We try to clean up the home. We reduce the allergic triggers in the environment. We detox people and then we address the infection. It's, it's a later step. And then uh, we encountered, you know, the, the, the bad thing in medicine is when you have a practice. It's great when you travel around and lecture like my, many of my colleagues do, you know, the stars in the field. They never have to bother with seeing patients. They're just kind of famous and they go from lecture to lecture. But actually me, actually tomorrow morning, I'm actually walking through my own waiting room in my practice and the people that are sitting there are all my failures because the ones that are cured they're not going to sit there that's my failures and so I have to look into the eye of my failures every day and so because I have a big ego much bigger than you know sort of like some of you um, a failure doesn't sit well with me and so I go the extra hour at night or in the morning to see what is it that I'm missing. And so in the course of that, I come up once in a while, every couple of years with a new idea. <laughs> Last year, I presented here the importance of uh, the exposure to electromagnetic fields, to electrosmog, as a huge issue in autism. Um, we measured the sleeping location where the moms were sleeping when they were pregnant with a child that was to become autistic a year and a half or two years later and measured an increase in electromagnetic field exposures between 10 and several hundred fold that of the control group of moms that were sleeping in locations that were giving birth to normal children. I don't want to use the term normal and abnormal here, but I don't, just don't know for ease of language a better term. And with that, the electromagnetic field exposure of the mother during pregnancy is the only predicting factor ever found so far in autism. The only thing that, that I know that has ever been able to predict it, I gave the lecture here and nothing happened. No phone calls, nobody was interested in how to measure, and so um, what I started doing, I realized, you know, if you have a new idea, you need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and eventually one person will hear it and do something with it and then maybe two and then it will grow exponentially. So right now, the electromagnetic field idea is still a new idea and underutilized by most of you. I have very strict uh, things I tell my uh, autistic parents what they have to do, they have to switch the fuses off at night, not just for parts of the house, but for the whole house. And they have to get a sleep sanctuary. It's a silver-coated mosquito net. It's a Faraday cage that's placed over the child's bed. And wireless internet is forbidden. 
and cordless phones are forbidden. So it's four things uh, that parents have to do. They're all, in the long run, incredibly inexpensive and uh, they're a precondition for a good outcome in the treatment of autistic children. Um, I have more recoveries to my name in terms of percentage of children that I treat than uh, any other practitioner that I know just because of this one measure. I'm not letting parents get through with it. I ask them the next visit, what are you doing? Well, my husband didn't allow me to switch off the fuses at night because he needs to go pee at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and then I ask them, okay, now you're sacrificing your child so your husband doesn't have to buy a $2 flashlight. I just put it very blunt uh, to the parents. And usually after like the fourth or fifth visit, now parents usually see me only every four to six months, so this may stretch over three years. Our average is now it takes the autistic family three years to hear me on this issue. Three years. And this has affected people. Now, when I talk to a politician who is not affected personally, who doesn't have autistic kids, you can imagine how long it will take there. So we got a long road to recovery ahead in terms of the collective intelligence, which is uh, we're dumbing down. I think we're all in agreement with that, you know, sort of uh, from what we see, and it has to do much with the uh, toxic world that we live in. Um, and so it's going to take longer and longer to get a new idea across. Now. For this reason, for this very reason, I picked an old topic that already has been in the field for 20 years and see if I can get through with this to you. Um, I will talk uh, about something that we rediscovered. It's called, in the American language, cryptopyroluria. And uh, I, I will take you through this. Basically, just to have a simple concept, it's a condition in which you pee out all your zinc. You basically become a, not a zinc deficient person, but a zinc less person. Yeah? We have about 300, we, well, we have about 1500 enzymes. You know, when you look at the methylation cycle and all that, it's all about enzymes that are programmed by the DNA to look a certain way, right? And there's an enzyme, the, the genome, and it creates a metabolome. This is the summation of all these 1,500 enzymes. 300 of those are zinc dependent. When you pee out all your zinc, the body to survive substitutes the zinc in the enzyme with another two valent metal and grabs whatever it can from our toxic environment. Usually that's cadmium if your parents smoke or it's lead if you live in a home that has lead residues or it's aluminum from the cookware or from other sources, or it's mercury from your mother usually, the, the transfer, the, the trans placenta transfer of mercury from mom into you. Mom discharges two thirds of her entire body burden of mercury into the firstborn child. And if the firstborn child is a boy, he's out of luck because testosterone has a, a dramatic synergistic effect with mercury. And so we got now 300 enzymes that should be having a zinc in the middle. Instead of that, they have a mercury, a nickel, cadmium, lead, uranium, plutonium, you name it in there that substituted. The enzyme still functions, not as well as it would with zinc, but it still functions. And so this is usually how we um, find the adult Lyme patient who is symptomatic and how we find the autistic kid in that state. And then the, the problem happens when we substitute zinc, we're knocking off these toxic metals and the child will become acutely toxic. And the reason this condition, cryptopyroluria, is that very reason because when Abraham Hoffer and others discovered this and started treating, adults and kids got very ill and then the collective of physicians said, well, this is bullshit, this really sucks. All we ever getting is sick kids that get sicker and sicker. It can't be right. Something must be wrong with the theory, right? This was before, because you cannot do the KPU treatment without deeply knowing about detox. You need to know how to get the mobilized crap out of the system. And so 
I tried the KPU treatment 20 years ago when I first learned about it. I had another bout with it 10 years ago, another bout five years ago. I never got it right. And then I met a physician in Holland who has created a whole following in Europe on just treating this one condition. And he has dramatic results with autism, dramatic results with all the psychiatric patients, dramatic results with Lyme disease. And I watched him, what he was doing different. And he was using my detox protocols that he copied off my website, that he had learned everything from me and had covered it with the KP, traditional KPU treatment. And suddenly there was this golden egg that I was looking for for the last 35 years as I've been in practice. And so I brought that back here about a year ago and ran my first trial runs with people and it was very dramatic. And so I want to share with you what this condition is, a little bit on the science, take you through it, through the treatment. It's, um, it's all easy, it's simple, it's inexpensive. Uh, this is the least expensive treatment you've ever given to your children. And so we're down now from whatever, 35 or $40,000 a year to maybe $4,000 a year uh, when you include this treatment and whatever you've done before. So it's a, a dramatic change in the, in the weather. So <clears throat> here's a little bit on the history. Abram Hoffer, um, who is misspelled here, he doesn't have an H in the Abraham, like a Burr, Bear, how do you say Burr? Um, Abe uh, lives close to me, he lives in Victoria, he actually just died a few weeks ago. And so the, I also want to give this lecture in honor of him. Um, he, uh, together with Linus Pauling, were really the, the two people that single-handedly started orthomolecular medicine. If you are taking vitamin C today, or carnitine, or alpha-lipoic acid, it's because of Abe Hoffer and Linus Pauling. They're the ones that started this whole thing, single-handedly. So Abe Hoffer is not a small thing. He's half of every vitamin that you ever took, every mineral you ever took. Abe Hoffer is half of that equation. And he was a psychiatrist, and he looked, uh, he was a, really a, a deeply influenced by Freud in his young years. And he was, like Freud always said, sometime in the future after my death, they're going to find that schizophrenia is a biochemical illness, not a psychological illness. And a prophet took that idea and was looking for a biomarker, what's different with the schizophrenic patients. And what he found was a compound in the urine that he uh, found with a simple electrophoretic procedure um, by, by uh, running urine through an electrophoretic gel. And he called it the morph factor because it turned the, the gel with the agency was using in a brownish color. For those foreigners like me here in the room, morph is sort of like an offshoot of, of brown. I, I hope I got that right. It's a purplish, brownish kind of color. Um, nobody uses that word elsewhere, but we use it here. So um, for me, as a foreigner, it wasn't easy to find my way through that. And he uh, falsely identified it as cryptopyrrole. Not him, but the biochemist he was working with it. And the name that he was given to that condition, cryptopyrrolurea, means that this compound is measured in the urine, um, stuck, and I'm going to call it this condition, even though the true compound that has just recently been identified is this one here, hydroxyhemopyrrolin 2 one And the international term of that is hemopyrrolactam. And really the hemopyrrolactam complex, because there's different compounds in the urine. And I, I get with what that is in a moment. And then if you want to do a Google on it, you need to have all those names here to find the whole literature, because um, each word only brings up a small number of articles. And if you get all of them, you need to have all the, all the words in there. So this early literature um, from the, you see this was 1958, and so this is from the early 60s. Um, but uh, even uh, an article in 1970 in Nature, you know, just kind of to, to show you the significance of that. 
medical journals and scientific journals are all internationally rated by their quality and by their scientific standing. The Journal of the American Medical Association is somewhere between the place 3,000 and 4,000. It fluctuates a little bit, one being the best and 6,000 being the worst. So the AMA journal is somewhere in the middle of that. Nature is the number three of all of these. And the article, one of the articles on it, is in Nature. And so, just to kind of show you, this is not like a small kind of, it's not an alternative medical, it's not like, you know, one of Jeffrey Bland's new ideas that he had last week that is going to go away next week and be replaced by something else. This is something that's been in the literature now for 50 years and it won't go away. It's, it's a big deal. Um, so, um, one problem we have in the U.S. is that the only test that we have is still for this compound with this little offshoot that we're not really looking for. You know, the main compound that makes people sick is this hemopyrolactam complex. But a lot of people have as an offshoot also this cryptopyrrole uh, complex, which is the only thing we can test for in U.S. labs. Um, what I want to say with this is that we have about a 30% rate where we have people with severe illness of this sort that will come out negative in the test, even if it's done correctly. And how do I know? Because I sent a few urines to the lab in Holland um, to double check. It's very, very complicated. I had to actually, by plane, take it on ice, the urine with me, to actually get it there. So it's not practical right now to, to bring it there. And all the children where I suspected that they tested negative in the U.S. lab were highly, highly positive in the Dutch lab, the test for HPU. So um, I suspect that more than 80% of kids have this condition and should be treated for it. And if you follow the kids properly, um, you will probably also see very dramatic uh, results. And I, I get into that uh, later. This is, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the test. Uh, I use vitamin diagnostics because uh, Tapan Audia, who is a research professor, he, he also lectures at the medical school in, at NYU, and he's um, a, a wonderful guy who really understands this condition. He wrote the decisive papers on it, but his own lab isn't doing the test right. Yeah, so there is a discrepancy with it, and it has to do with FDA issues to get any new test uh, into the U.S you have to have a, a reference lab, another lab that actually does the same testing, and if there isn't, you're out of luck. Yeah? Basically, you need to do research from, uh, to validate a new test, uh, cost the lab uh, today about half a million dollars in the test that is done to introduce a new test. And it's just a small lab and can't afford it. And so we're sort of stuck with this test. So I will coach you through how to use this test and at least optimize this one. So that you get the, the best readings that we can. This is a, um, this is a, a kid, he, he was born 1963, so not quite a kid anymore, an adult autistic. Um, that uh, the, the upper value uh, in the crypto parallel test is 15. This is at 67. And the only thing you need to know about this test is if you're twice normal, twice the upper end of normal, that indicates severe condition. Anything above 30 in the US test indicates severe condition. Yeah? So this is the, the only measure that you need to remember for, uh, not for this course, but when you go home and do the test. The test costs about $55. So it is a shame, you know, I'm mean, be doing all the, the ion panel for 550 bucks and we do the fatty acid analysis for 400 bucks and we do all these things and there's a $60 test that supersedes all these other tests that we're not doing. Um, that now quickly a little bit through the, the things that are known. Uh, KPE, KPU patients or HPU patients lose superphysiological amounts of zinc, B6, biotin and manganese. Those are the four big ones yeah, that need to be replaced in the treatment. And um, I, I tell you, right, so those of you who know dosages a little bit, adult dosages, right, in, in, you know, in an adult 
uh, male, we would probably give them 25 to 30 milligrams of zinc, like in a normal substitution program. In this uh, program, we give 250 to 400 milligrams of zinc every day. Yeah? Because what you're peeing out every day is in the region of 100 to 150 milligrams. And replacing 30 milligrams, you still worse, your condition is still getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, so that is you have to know. These are super physiological amounts that you're losing, and you're losing them irregularly. You're also losing them in the in the skin, in the sweat, and in the stool. This this loss is a global loss to all body fluids and all body uh, substances that are excreted. So, what is this thing? Well, this condition, uh, this molecule that you're peeing out, is an improperly synthesized heme molecule. Let me just kind of, rather than looking there, look at me for a moment so, so you don't get distracted by all the writing. Uh, heme, of course, is the building block of hemoglobin, but is also the building block of uh, cytochromes. Cytochromes are those enzyme components that are used in the mitochondria. They're used in the P450 pathway of liver detox. Um, they use the, the component of multiple enzymes in the methylation pathway. I, I'll show you that little picture at the end where you see how big this issue is. And to make heme, we need N, it's, it's like simple, sim, similar to the mitochondria in the Krebs cycle, you have eight steps to, you know, to create lactic acid and ATP and all that. Uh, to make heme, there's also eight enzymatic steps, there's eight enzymes needed to do this. And in HPU, anywhere from, up from one to all eight enzymes can be blocked. And depending on how many are blocked, the illness looks differently. <coughs> and I give you right away like what we know so far from the science, what's causing this. One, it's early childhood psychological trauma. Yeah? That's known in the literature from Abram Hoffer because you look carefully at that. The second one is chronic infections. And I, I give you sort of my interpretation of that because that will make sense to you. Lyme disease, to establish itself in our body, has to use a number of molecular tricks to evade your immune system. And everybody looks now at molecular mimicry and there's always like the, the, the uh, taste du jour of, of what the what the bugs do to evade the immune system, right? Depending on who lectures, you see all these complicated graphs with the white cells and the T lymphocytes and stuff until your eyes kind of go like that, you know, sort of, and only the lecturer knows what they have in mind. But I do something different. I put myself in the mind of the bug. What would I do if I was a bug and I wanted to live in you? <clears throat> but first of all, once I'm in there, I don't want to fight every day. <clears throat> I don't want to run a complicated biochemical protocol every day to kind of evade your system. I want to do the one-time thing that I do occasionally with one molecule that kind of subdues you and makes you a comfortable host. <clears throat> and the bugs have figured that out by blocking one of these enzymes. Now these enzymes have a long half-life. By blocking one of these enzymes and making you pee out your zinc, I'm completely disarming your immune system with one stroke. I do what a thousand generals and a thousand armies cannot do. With one molecule, I'm blocking the key enzyme that will completely disarm your immune system. Zinc and manganese are absolute essential parts for your white blood cells to create the components. Thank you so much. And, and, and cappuccino, please, next. <laughs> with, with, with sugar at the bottom. So, <clears throat> I know I'm right with this, I can't prove this to you, but usually things that I, you know, when I meditate and kind of put myself in the mind of the bugs, I know that that's what they're doing. It's one of the uh, molecular mechanisms mechanism of the bugs that officially have not been discovered yet. Yeah? But we know there is a great link between chronic infections and zinc deficiency, and everybody looks, well, we are giving them 30 milligrams of zinc and nothing is happening. Yeah, because he's peeing out 300 and you're giving 30. It's like, you know, if you have a fire burning and you come with a little 
you know, with, with, with a thimble full of water and put it on there and say, well, I tried to put the fire out and put the thimble of water in there and it's still burning. Yeah, it's a dose-dependent relationship in, in this game. And so, infection, chronic infection can uh, be responsible for blocking these enzymes. So it can be an acquired condition. And what I found, and I'm so far the only one looking at that in numbers, is that close to 100% of my Lyme patients have this condition. And I know that not every one of my Lyme patients has had significant early childhood trauma. Yeah? And I know that a lot of my Lyme patients had a very, very normal childhood until they were like 22 or 25, they were bitten by a tick. And then the illness clearly started with that. There was no precondition there, clearly started there. And yet, 10 years later, they're all having HPU. And that means it's an acquired condition in a lot of cases. And I'm postulating to you that autism is a congenitally acquired form of Lyme disease with all the changes that we know. Everything we know about autism can be explained by congenitally acquired Lyme disease. Every aspect of it. I know, and I will probably mention it later, that mold plays a key role in this. You cannot have Lyme disease in an adult without having a preceding injury with mold or a preceding condition of HPU. Yeah, we know that only 20% of the people infected with Borrelia are symptomatic. We know that 100% of people that have HPU that get bitten by a Lyme tick become symptomatic. So HPU is a frequent precondition to develop Lyme disease, but it can also be caused by Lyme disease. Um, I give you a personal example. Of course, I'm, you know, I'm looking at this because I'm affected myself, and it was the biggest thing in like 30 years of Lyme treatment for me. But I tested my mom. My mom is highly positive in, in HPU, and she was sick all her life. She grew up on a farm in East Prussia, and as we Germans know, in Lyme disease or spirochetal infections, Borrelia infection had been around for thousands of years in Europe. It's not a new illness. What is new is the behavior of the illness in us that's making us ill. And I, I get to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, maybe I should say that now. It's another thing that while your brain is reasonably fresh, um, <laughs> no, it's just maybe interesting to you. You know, I did the, you know, many of the ideas that I have, you know, I, I'm not a rich guy. I'm actually, you know, quite inexpensive overall. You know, my, my patients see me only once every four to six months. Yes, on, on that visit, they pay 400 bucks or 450 bucks. I don't know how much it is. But it's like, you know, it's three visits a, a year max, you know. And for that, they get everything I know. And usually, pretty good success rate. You know, but they spend substantially more. Even if I go just to an acupuncturist once a week, they're spending a lot more. So. I'm always looking at inexpensive solutions. So my research in this case, and this is really the most important piece of research you need to know about that I've done. I got together in Switzerland with one of the main mold researchers. And I had the idea uh, that's going to be evident to you when I describe the experiment. We had two mold cultures, and he had a way of measuring the amount of mycotoxins that are produced on a daily basis. And so we grew, we, we took the same amount of mold culture, put them in a, in a culture plate, and one culture we protected with a Faraday cage. We protected it from the incoming cell phone, uh, microwave radiation, and from the ambient fields in the laboratory. The other culture we just set on the desk, and we measured the values are very comparable to the values that you have in your sleeping location. And we let the thing grow for three weeks, and then we measured the amount of mycotoxins in each one. In the one that was protected, we found a very, very low amount of mycotoxins in the culture. In the one that was unprotected, the amount was 600 times more than the one that was not protected. 
And my simple thesis that evolved from there is this. We all have molds and candida and aspergillus and mucor and, 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 and penicillin species fungi in us. No matter who you are, even you, Doris. <laughs> you got it at least in your sinuses and at least, you know, between your toes and, you know, all of us in the gut to some degree, but I'm also holding the point, most of us also in the connective tissue, some stray molds that have found their way into the body. Now, you're exposing these molds now. Now, the other measure, you know, since 1995, the amount of electromagnetic field exposure that we're exposed to has gone up 30 million times. Thir not 30 times, not 300, 30 million times the amount of density of electromagnetic waves and one cc of air here, as we're speaking, from the wireless internet and the cell phone wave, and now the, the, uh, the digital TV and the satellite, this and that, 30 million times. And now, what do you think the molds in us are going to think about that? They're going to do exactly what my mold experiment did, that the ones that are not protected are going to maximize their mycotoxin production. And that's what we're finding. There's a fairly new mycotoxin urine test out that you need to know about. There's this guy, Hooper, who developed it. The government has these tests for a long time. Um, I know neuroscience is now uh, promoting the same test. It's expensive. It's a couple of hundred bucks. We can look out of the hundreds and hundreds of mycotoxins that are known, we can now look at three. Uh, it's uh, okra toxin, aflatoxin, and who knows what the third one is? You guys haven't done the test yet. Okay. It's probably the most important test for autistic kids that has come about in the last, since HPU, that's only 60 bucks. But, oh, you're an angel. You're an absolutely angel. Okay, you guys. I, I was trying to order a coffee this morning, and after like an hour. Thank you. I had breakfast here, and um, I don't know, did you guys wait for over an hour for your coffee? I mean, and it never came. Um, I don't know what, what the deal was. So, we have this mycotoxin urine test now, and it's shocking to see how high many of the children are in the urine. This is just to confirm what Doris and I knew for many years, all these kids have mold on board. I mean, I heard Doris lecture just a few weeks ago, so fresh on my mind. Um, um, many of us were big on mold you know, for years before the Lyme disease thing happened. Um, you know, one of the viruses was like the, you know, the thing that we sort of were into for a long time. So, let me repeat this. The infectious, the, the microbes that lived in us symbiotically for probably four and a half billion years are feeling attacked by the environmental toxins and by the electrosmog. Nothing has gone up that much, 30 million times increase in exposure. This is insane. This is simply insane. I mean, this is not this is beyond insane. This is suicidal. This is absolutely suicidal. And so the bugs in us feel attacked. They're producing more biotoxins than they ever did. And that's basically what's making us sick. That's what's creating autism. That's what's creating the symptoms of Lyme disease. That's what's creating all the neurological diseases, the learning disabilities, the dyslexia, the, the MS, the ALS, the Parkinson, the, uh, the brain degeneration, the short-term memory loss, the hyperactivity, and the insomnia that you all have. Yeah? It all goes back to a few biotoxins in us that are produced at unprecedented rates. And we can show that now with the stupid urine test um, that is so simple to do. It's a one-time shot. It's not a 24-hour collection on the, on the mycotoxin test. And it reveals that what I just said is true. It's just I give you the picture from, from my angle. And so with that also the focus in treating the infections in us becomes different. It is not enough to bombard somebody with antibiotics. It's not going to put the bugs back in a symbiotic environment with us. Yeah. We have to change the inner environment. We have to detox, detox, detox. And fourthly, we have to detox. And beyond that, we have to detox. 
And beyond that, we have to protect the person as much as we can from the electro smoke that we're all exposed to. It is not just another idea, it's not just a small thing on the side that you can also do. It's a principle in which healing can only happen now if we create that protection. And, and I don't know how to drive that point more, uh, more than this. So, I'm going back to this. So, the, the, the causes that so far are proven with, with HPU is early childhood psychological trauma and infection. I have shown that the psychological trauma can be removed one, two or three generations. That means, in my case, it was my mother who was traumatized. She was a, a young woman in the Second World War and she lost both her parents. She lost everybody that she knew. Uh, that was a huge trauma and she was healthy until then. And then her health crashed. And 60 years later, a little bit more than 60 years later, her son diagnoses her with HPU. And there is no indication in the generation before her and her parents or her grandparents, they all lived until normal age, until the, well, her parents were both shot in the Second World War, so they, you know, they didn't get to prove that they didn't have HPU, but their parents lived until the way into the hundreds. And so the, the condition that everybody was sick started with my mom, started with psychological trauma, but then her son was born with that. I was born with HPU. I mean, I have the living proof that I had all the signs of it when I, was, I came to the planet. The only reason I, came, I became a doctor is because I was always sick. <laughs> and, sort of, and, and so I'm, I have a passion for this. So just briefly, so heme is needed for liver detox reaction for the cytochromes. The cystothionin synthase, now the, the, the uh, CBS mutation, and kind of, you know, it's that enzyme in that area. Some of you, the Amy Yaskoas here in the room, yeah, you know about that one. Rather than looking at the, at the mutation, let's look at the damn heme molecule that's attached to this thing. If this enzyme may have a mutation or not, we don't know if it's, it's a polymorphism. Is this one actually the one that's copied or the healthy other one that's there? But what we didn't look for is that this is a heme-dependent enzyme. And if you don't make heme, the enzyme doesn't work and you can't your whole sulfur pathway is screwed up and you can't make glutathione and the whole thing is secondary. It's all sec these are all symptoms of HPU. Um, so, I say here, KPU, HPU patients have low serum glutathione levels, high nitric oxide levels. I show you the, uh, this in a different way. Here's Hoffer's early numbers that he published that he found with the miserable KPU test that misses most of these. He still found 27 out of 39 schizophrenics positive. It's very high in criminals, so criminal deviant behavior is caused by this condition because it screws with your mind. Yeah, you become schizoid. Um, in Down syndrome, it's very, very high and it's very dramatic. How much you can improve children with Down syndrome with this? I, I was astounded in my first couple of cases after a year of taking some down people in, in Germany, older down patients that were in the teens, um, with dramatic improvements in their cognition. Um, in autism, the early uh, numbers from Hoffer, this is now 30 years ago, was 50%. This is with the most miserable collection method, not knowing that you have to cool the thing, that you have to put vitamin C to it to actually preserve the compound. The compound is very volatile and disappears from the pea. I get into how to collect that properly. He still got 50%. Now, I mentioned this year, Lyme disease and co-infections, we get over 80% now that are positive. Um, in, in toxic patients where we have the running diagnosis of mercury or lead retention, uh, we find uh, that 75% are highly, highly positive with HPU and that should be the first line of treatment. So a uh, little bit about the symptoms, and I got them so a little bit organized differently from your handout. Um, abdominal tenderness is a very, very common symptom in children, ASD children, uh, with, with Lyme disease. And, and most of you know it's hard sometimes to tell for a mom even if the child is hurting or not. But I tell you, very often they are. Uh, and 
uh, constipation, all of you are familiar with that one. The light and sound intolerance is a really, really big clue. Also for you grown-up guys, those of you here who have trouble with light sensitivity, please test yourself for HPU. Do yourself that favor. Um, the whole hypoglycemia, glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, the whole scheme, look at HPU. Most people are positive and then by doing the treatment that fixes the condition, bypassing all the other things that we know about it. Um, very important is the China doll look uh, that I think uh, Pfeiffer uh, coined, Carl Pfeiffer. Carl Pfeiffer was close in working with this condition, but he didn't know about the detox. So he messed it all up by, by doing it almost right, but missing the most important piece that I get into later. Um, so these uh, children, not always, they can look completely normal, but if they have this nice transparent look, and I and, um, uh, uh, want to, let me see, did I write it down here? I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit mean sometimes. Um, you know that uh, indigo children look, there ain't such a thing as indigo children. This is sort of a way of rationalizing that we screwed these children up and we try to make it something sacred so we don't have to do anything about it. These are children that we heard really, really badly. And the indigo children look is a KPU look. And that goes away when you treat it. They become normally tanning children that don't look so transparent, like you can look through them. Um, tremor, shaking, spasm. This is all, these are just things that from the literature. These are not my own words. Yeah, so please, yeah, these are not words I crafted. I just copied them straight out of the KPU, HPU literature. Environmental and food allergies. Has anybody ever seen a child with food allergies? Or environmental allergies? You know, the most common denominator is this HPU condition. Um, so, HP, uh, autism, most symptoms of autistic, autistic spectrum disorder, um, cold hands and feet, uh, the whole hormone screwed up uh, complex, you know, with the uh, high testosterone levels and the, the early onset of puberty, or late onset of puberty in some. Uh, and then comes the whole thing, the stress intolerance, you know, children that can only handle one stimulus at a time. You make the room dark, you put one candle in there and they're freaking out because there's already too much stimulation. That's HPU unless proven otherwise. Um, the whole uh, emotional instability, anxiety withdrawal, paranoia, hallucinations, perceptual disorganization. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. You can read that up in your, in your handout. Um, now, a little bit on my personal sort of things that, personal clinical tips for those of you here who are familiar with lab work. So, the most common lab abnormality is the children and also grown ups present usually with an elevated LDL and a low HDL. Fascinating for me that that reverses when you're about eight months to a year into treatment. You know, what are all the other things that we've learned to get HDL up? <laughs> Lipitor <laughs> and you know, all the medical drugs that are supposed to do that or niacin, garlic, fish oil, all the things that we do. But it's nowhere in the literature that HPU is both often the cause and the treatment for this. Um, very often we see a low alkafos, you know, alkafos is, is part of our standard blood test in the US and it's an enzyme that's both zinc and ma magnesium um, dependent and so we often find that low. However, if the condition has been there for a long time, the alkafos goes back in the normal range because the zinc is now substituted usually with cadmium and when we give uh, calcium EDTA or so these kids pee out astronomical amounts of cadmium and lead and then the arc force crashes because we took the metals away that actually sustained the arc force at the high level. So if you do a detox protocol and the arc force goes down instead of up, it's another proof of HPL. Um, the low, um, those of you who follow Patricia Kane and, and have done her red cell membrane fatty acid test, you know a lot of kids come back with that the omega-6 deficient as a surprise. And, 
Patricia was really hard on me there in the beginning because I put everybody on fish oil following Joe McCola. <laughs> and then uh, Patricia came, beat me up and said, Dietrich, you're overlooking that everybody of your kids has omega-6 deficient. She had like a whole, she, she presented me with a whole slew that she's accumulated of tests that I'd sent into her lab. And, and she really called me up and said, Dietrich, you're missing something here. All your kids are omega-6 deficient. You're doing something wrong with the nutrition. But what it was, that I was the only practitioner at the time that only sent in the, the blood from autistic kids and adult grown-up autistics, i.e. people with MS, ALS, Parkinson's. And, and so in that group, the people don't need just omega-3, they need omega-6 really, really badly because they're peeing it out. On a daily basis, they're peeing out lots of it, ounces of it. And, and so if you do that test and you find that your kid is deficient in the red cell membrane of omega-6, suspect that they got HPU. Um, uh, taurine always comes up low in the amino acid profile, and taurine is very, very important to substitute in these kids. They often have a low MCV, mean corpuscular volume, uh, so yeah, a high MCV, looking similar to the B12 deficiency and the folic acid deficiency, but it's actually the B6 that's missing. That's a cofactor in there. And then the surprising thing that's going to be a little contradictory to what I'm going to show in a moment is um, that when you look in the white blood cell and red blood cell zinc and manganese level, you should expect that they would be low. They're only low if the HPU has just been acquired a few months ago. But if the HPU has been there for a few years, the zinc and manganese levels in the red blood and white blood cell is the last thing that's going to drop before the patient croaks. It's the last thing before death. The bones, we did bone biopsies. Uh, Chris, we, we sent in our jaw bone biopsies in Germany with Lechner, I did that, and looked at zinc levels and manganese levels in the jaw bone, which are naturally higher than other bone. We couldn't find a single zinc molecule in these people. Not a single zinc molecule. It wasn't just that their levels were low. They were empty. Their jaw bone was empty of zinc and manganese. And my new theory on the cavitations is that that's the precondition because everybody with whose cavitation forming in the jawbone has tested highly positive on HPU. So it's a, it's a new idea in our field. And jawbone or any bone that doesn't have any zinc or any manganese to work with cannot heal. So after extractions, these people lose their jawbone, it deteriorates, and, and things go from bad to worse. Um, so um, common physical signs, yeah? Is a China doll look, or if one of the moms, I can't hear it anymore, comes to me and says, I got an indigo baby, I don't want you to spiritually hurt this baby. I don't want you to do anything that disconnects it from the spirit world. You know, I, I believe, I, I, I know that we are a spirit trying to have an earthly experience. It's not about being a body trying to have a spiritual experience. Yeah? We're here to have an earthly experience and I will do everything I can to give these kids an earthly experience, to have them re-enter their body. It's like sort of, you know, like, like a, you know, they're orbiting around themselves, energetically speaking, you know, sort of, and they're not quite making it through the layer of, of the atmosphere, they're bouncing back off it. You know, I'm trying to let them re-enter into their physical body. So, very often the kids come with a history of eczema, skin eruptions, fungal infections, herpes uh, virus outbreaks. Uh, on the index finger, I've seen a couple of kids that have that all the perioral herpes type 1 type lesions, um, sometimes even herpes zoster. And they do really poorly on the ch childhood diseases if they get them. Because, you know, on one hand, once we have the diagnosis of autism, we tell the kids, the moms, to never vaccinate again, ever if they want to stay my patient. You know, that's an absolute taboo for me. But then when they do get the childhood illnesses and you have a fixed KPU, they get quite ill with it. So parents kind of sneaking back to their pediatrician and let them, <laughs> let the kids be vaccinated because they're confused about that. You know, on one hand, they understand the vaccinations are bad. On the other hand, they experience that when the kids are sick, they're really, really sick. And so, they're giving some value to the vaccination issue and they get confused in the middle. So be aware of that. Then often because of the biotin deficiency 
and as I will show you later, the silica deficiency. Um, they usually have very fine hair. That's you know part of the indigo look. They have very thin fingernails and toenails. The toenails are often sort of look like uh, popcorn crisps. They're a little bit sort of uh, deformed because they're so thin. They can hold their shape. Um, and then uh, over the first couple of years, they usually self-correct. Uh, very often, they have a bloated belly. Zinc deficiency doesn't go well with the gut lining and, and all the, the different microbes in the gut. And so they have the typical sort of yeasty, yeasty feeling in the belly. But if you treat the yeast, you have to treat it forever. If you treat the KPU, you also have to treat it forever. But the treatment of KPU costs you on a long run 50 cents a day. But the treatment with Sporanox costs you like 18 bucks a day. So you get to choose there. Um, and then uh, they don't like to move very often because they, they have knee, hip, and ankle pain very, very often with the condition. And then, uh, I don't know if you know that book, Mr. Bump, is one of the favorite books of my, my little kids. Mr. Bump is the guy who falls in every hole and, and, and hits his head everywhere where he can, possibly, by accident. So the HBU kids are often Mr. or Mrs. Bump. You know, they're always falling, they hurt themselves very frequently because they, they have a, a moderate degree of ataxia and, and you know, the, the different neurological terms. I don't know them anymore all because every day there's a new term, you know, of how to call this when, they, when, they, you know, when they're a little bit discoordinated. But that all clears up with the treatment. Then very often they have an anal itch, you know, uh, the frequent parasites. They're totally stress intolerant and have difficulty sleeping. These are just sort of some key things that, that I see with it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's all look, called also leukonychia, these white spots on the fingernails. Um, they're uh, present in about 60% of HPU patients, uh, but please, if you don't see that, it doesn't mean they don't have it. But if they do have it, you don't have to go any further with making a diagnosis of the zinc deficiency. Yeah? Interesting thing is when somebody has been lifelong zinc deficient and you actually give them zinc, this gets worse for a whole year yeah? because the system wakes up in a different way and now fills in zinc levels in places that were completely substituted with, mangan with, with, with cadmium, nickel, mercury, lead and the zinc goes into those places and the, the person wakes up in a strange way where certain aspects of the zinc deficiency may get worse for the first six or eight months in treatment because the system wakes up and utilizes the zinc, stuffs the zinc in places where it should be, where it hasn't been in, in a number of years. Um, so, um, rather than, than showing you this, I'm just going to take you through the nice pictures that I have on this. They're from Tapan Audia, from his study that he did. So, uh, what you see here, this axis is the more you have the, of that HPL complex in the P, uh, this is the level of vitamin B6 available in the system. So the more HP, HPL you create, the more you pee out your zinc. Uh, so your B6. Now this is that part. The same um, connection with zinc and the white blood cells, even though I said um, I have a lot of kids where the white blood cell zinc is completely normal and they do have a huge amount of HPU. And in the grown-ups, I could show, if you do a bone biopsy, their bone is completely deficient of zinc. Yeah? So the white blood cells are the last thing that loses to zinc. So if that goes down, things are really, really, really bad. Yeah? This is the last, last hotel before the end of the universe. And here's the connection with biotin. And biotin is often forgotten, even by old-timers that treat HPU. Uh, and the adult dose of biotin is... Uh, 10 to 20 milligrams a day. So uh, in these children, uh, it's a minimum of two and a half milligrams uh, a day. There is some products out that don't use binders and fillers. Um, I just, just maybe make that remark here. Autistic children do not do well with magnesium stearate. They don't do well with titanium dioxide. and Please use products that are completely free of those two absolute evil things that are poison for these kids. 
Now here is an exciting one. I think it should be exciting to most of you that the more uh, positive you are on HPL, the more glutathione, reduced glutathione deficiency. And how much, how much have you gone around in circles to diagnose glutathione deficiencies, to try to fix glutathione deficiencies, to inject glutathione, transdermal glutathione, liposomal glutathione. You stuff glutathione in every avenue of the kid. You know, it's a symptom of this. It's not a cause. Yes, you need glutathione to function, to detox and all that. But why not fix the reason why you don't have it rather than supplementing it? Um, other one is a connection with nitric oxide. Uh, you know, nitric oxide is a double-edged sword. When you make love, you want to have it in the arteries of your penis if you're a guy, but you don't want to necessarily have it in the wrong parts of the brain where it's highly toxic. Yeah? It's a toxic nitrogen compound to many parts of the brain, and so it goes up in those components of the brain where you don't want it. Good. Uh, here's Amy Yasko's picture on the methylation cycle. I just want to show you when you losing zinc, manganese, um, magnesium, and you're not making proper heme. Just to point out just a few places that we, we're talking about here. So here is the urea cycle, and there is a very, very uh, big heme molecule as part of the NOS enzyme. And if this is not, if this not ain't working, you create peroxynitrite, the most toxic uh, oxidative substance that we create in the brain and we know that these children's brains are toxic with peroxynitrite. Uh, then if I'm, I'm just going to jump, I'm, I'm not going to bother you with this because it's something you're not supposed to remember. I just want to give you a little bit of a, of a teaser. Right here is a famous methylation cycle and uh, an important enzyme here is the methionine synthase. Um, that's Dr. Dees. Uh, uh, sort of favorite enzyme to look at. You know, you can hang your whole career on one of these enzymes. I think, uh, I don't know where Amy Yasko is right now. It's probably the, the CBS mutation was for a long time a favorite. But, I, you know, every biochemist kind of, when they start looking at one enzyme, there's so much literature on each one of these enzymes. It's a whole lifetime study. And so, depending on who you talk to, they have their favorite kind of thing. Let me let me kind of let my favorite today be the methionine synthase, just to in introduce you to it. So this enzyme basically determines how the cycle is run here. And as a byproduct of the cycle, you, you, you enter this cycle here where you make your glutathione. You know, or you know, where your sulfur detox happens down here. You know, glutathione, sulfur detox. OK, just follow me with this. OK, so now for, for the system to run the cycle, successfully, so on one end, you're adding methyl groups to the DNA. This is to silence all the viruses and all the bad things in the DNA. You need methyl groups. So it's decided by this enzyme. And on the other hand, it needs to run the cycle to make enough glutathione so you can detox. Yeah, just, just follow me in very simple terms with it. So don't try to get lost in all these other things. Now, if you're exposed to certain toxins, lead, aluminum, mercury, like all our kids are, then this enzyme here is induced to run the cycle to produce more glutathione so you can deal with the toxins. And to run that, it needs more methyl groups. And the methyl groups either come by demethylating the DNA and therefore thus liberating all the viruses that have been silenced in you. Now the herpes viruses are blooming in these children or by working the new Brander protocol and injecting methyl groups every other day or so with methyl B12 into the children. That's the other choice that you have. But they're both stupid choices. Because what you really should do is detox the patient. And to run the detox, remember, and this is sort of like a big point I'm going to make, the, the <laughs> The only way you can successfully remove mercury and aluminum and other... Uh, the, the reason these, these are making this toxic is because the methionine synthase is one of the many zinc-dependent enzymes. And if you don't have zinc, then the aluminum and the mercury and the lead attaches to here. 
and you can now give all the methyl groups in the, in the world and the kids are going to do better. But what you really should do is supplement the zinc in high enough doses to knock the mercury back out of here, to drive it out. And the only way you can do that by on one hand knocking it out with the zinc and on the other hand standing by with a strong detox agent that captures the mercury and takes it out of the body. And that has worked. And I'm, I'm going to take you there here in the next, I don't know, half hour or so, how to do that. So, just to show you the, the impact of, the, of the, the, the HPL. So, this enzyme is also, this enzyme complex here is not only heme dependent but it's also zinc dependent. Yeah. Here's the, the, the walk from trimethylglycine to dimethylglycine is zinc dependent. Here's the magnesium that's lost with the, with the HPL condition. Um, if you go down here, the CBS enzyme is B6 dependent, which is lost uh, with the HPL. Here is a heme that's part of this enzyme. Here, oh, to, to, uh, to unbuild cystothionine, you need B6. That is blocked. So you can't make your glutathione, you can't make any of this. So there is multiple places here that we need to think about more. We can't just look at the genes and kind of assume that we have to bypass the genes. We have to first look at the, uh, what's it called? So there is a genome, and we need to look at the metabolome, and we need to kind of know it's a stupid metabolism here and kind of see that there's some basic ingredients missing because we're peeing them out every day. You know? and, and that should come first before we try to bypass the genes. Now, there's a big point I'm trying to make here. Um, when to suspect HPU? Well, if somebody has a diagnosis of autism or red or Asperger or Lyme or chronic fatigue and all the other stuff. Yeah? So here's my instruction how to do the test. I, I, I just read it to you so that you, that, that you know these are not the instructions you're going to get from any of the American labs. Don't ask me why. I mean, Tapana is a master. He gives in his writing, he gives the exact instructions, but his own lab has no idea. They think you're nuts when you collect the thing according to what the lab director says, how it should be done. The lab technicians have no idea. So that was a strange experience for me <laughs> to, to be called by the lab technicians. Are you doing the test all wrong? It's just a one-time shot urine collection. It's not supposed to be a 24 urine. And they haven't read the paper of the guy who runs their own lab. So, I mean, it could happen to me because I'm not good at supervising people, but that it happens to somebody else uh, surprised me. So, the unfortunate thing with this test is uh, kids have to be for five days really up uh, off everything. You know? They cannot be on antimicrobials because antimicrobials change the equation here. They cannot be on any mineral or any B vitamin. Then the child should be stressed to the maximum. For me, it's ideal when kids come to my office, they usually fly from some other state or country to me. They haven't slept for a few nights. They're really irritated. It's the ideal time to collect the urine. Yeah? So I, I, I do that as a stress test. So, you know, with you, some of you have done that here in the room, flying to me. We're not going to waste that, that stress, but we're going to sort of put it into action. Or when people fly home, they start collecting during the flight or immediately afterwards when the child is really nicely stressed because that's when most of the compounds come out. Now, the HPU compound has a half-life in urine of 10 hours. That is not very long because if you do a 24-hour collection, you know, your first P is already down to one-fourth you know, by the end of the 24 hours. You've lost already a lot. So you can extend the life of the complex by keeping it in the fridge. The trouble with the fridge is the electromagnetic field in the fridge. And so we recommend to wrap the whole container in alufoil. That has the second advantage, it needs to be completely dark. Because light breaks down this complex, electromagnetic fields break it down. You want to keep it cool. Uh, okay, I take your question, but I'm, in general, I'm not opening this to questions. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, with autistic kids, the practice. Thanks for reminding me. That, yeah, because I'm not very. I'm not a practical person. I have my my natural path that work with me that translate all this into you know now what you really do when you're a mom. 
you can't walk around with the you know with a girl with a urine container attached to them. Um, the the urine is made the compound is amazingly stable when it's frozen. So I recommend to catch the pee whenever you can and freeze it several something times over like a week or ten days. And then you put that all together and thaw it, shake it up and then put that into the transport vial that's given to you. There is, um, let me go through the rest of this and then you know, exposure to normal stresses is needed. If you want to kind of amp it up a little bit, a little extra stress is a good idea. Then. Uh, Tapan told us to use the simply a large milk carton or orange carton. Now, many of you autistic moms have not seen a milk carton in a long time. Um, so you buy some milk and pour it out. Whatever is the cheapest that you can buy, it's that, that, it's that paper container you know, with that particular liner in it that's ideal for the collection. And it saves a lot of money on this test for not sending out the stupid orange plastic container that is then put filling the land waste in the U.S. now, you know, in, in, in quite irresponsible ways. So uh, we use that, and then we put uh, we put 500 cc, no, 500 milligrams of ascorbic acid, you know, a teaspoon. This is pure ascorbic acid. You buy for like three bucks, you know, in the local, in the local whatever, almost hardware store. I can say, you know, so you can get it anywhere. This is not any of the sophisticated vitamin C. This is really pure ascorbic acid. And a teaspoon, a flat teaspoon, uh, a normal sized teaspoon, uh, contains about four grams of vitamin C, little less, about three and a half grams or so. And so I just say, kind of like, a, you know, put a little less than a fourth of a teaspoon in there, and there will be enough for a child for the collection. It can be too much, it doesn't destroy the compound, so this is not an exact science. Yeah, but the vitamin C needs to be in there. And then um, you wrap aloe foil around the container, um, you put it in the fridge, keep it there, and now comes the important one. At the very end, when you have it in a transport tube, you want to put that in the freezer. Because some of the compounds that come out in the pee that are the worst of them are called tetrapyroles, and they're not detectable in the lab with that normal test. However, when you freeze it, the tetrapyroles break down to monopyroles and can then be detected. Yeah? And by following this protocol, this is how we got these high detection rates of HPL, even with the incorrect test that we have in the US. Yeah? And so I, you know, if you do it right, play it that way. The, the compound that they, they, uh, Tapan said, like, uh, even if you store it in the freezer for three weeks, it's still good. There's some loss in it, but it's still good. You know, and so if you need to do little microscopic collections here and there, interesting enough is the lab tells you in writing you should do a one-time morning collection. In his papers, he had proven that the main excretion of HPL is in the afternoon. His own lab says collect in the morning a fresh morning urine. Yeah, so the Dutch experience is you need like different samples across the day because it's very typical to the person, not to the condition, when they're peeing out the zinc and the cryptopyroles. You know, one kid, it may be at two at night, the other one may be at two in the afternoon, the other one may be around dinner. There seems to be a peak around four or five p.m. in the afternoon, where a larger number of these kids pee out most of it. So if you do a one-time collection, do it late afternoon, like around dinner time, you know, that, that is, has the highest yield, not the morning, morning urine. Okay, now here's the treatment. I'm going to spend just a moment on that and then I'm going to rush you through a couple of other things. So these are adult dosages. This is for a 160 pound adult. Yeah? And then you can do, usually most children that I treat are around 40 pounds. Yeah, so it would be a fourth of that. So it's zinc in high doses, 250 milligrams a day. Now, we don't start with this. We, we, we ease them into, we start with like 30 milligrams of zinc and people with KPU will always be very nauseous on it. The reason for the nausea is that zinc needs to be uh, broken down, put in watery solution in the acidic environment of the stomach. However, 
the enzyme that creates the stomach acid, the carboanhydrase, is a zinc-dependent enzyme. So, I forgot to mention this, everybody with this condition is hypochlorhydric, they don't make stomach acid. And so those people cannot break down the zinc and absorb it because it doesn't go into solution. You know? Metals go in solution in acidic environments. And that's why chronic metal toxic people are acidic. It's an attempt of the body to get the metals out. And then, you know, some people are so smart and then override the system's desire and alkalinize the patient and fixate the metals in all the tissues, which is not a great idea. Um, so, you ease your way into this at the speed that the patient allows you to go. And we like people to take all the minerals as much as possible in the morning and maybe between morning and lunchtime because in the evening, as you will see, we need to detox. We need to capture the metals. And unfortunately, these are all two valent metals that come out. That means whatever detox agent we use will be equally binding the zinc, the manganese, as it will lead in mercury. We do not have mercury or lead specific detox agents. We got two valent metal specific detox agents or self hydro affinitive detox agents. And unfortunately, manganese and zinc are both sulfur self hydro affinitive metals. That means that they oxidize with sulfur just like mercury and lead does. And so we cannot give the detox program at the same time as we give the minerals. And to split it up, the, the main natural time when the body detoxes is at night from 11 to 3 o'clock and so this is why we want to support the detox at night and then therefore give the minerals in the morning. Yeah. Do you have that? There's a rhythm to this that's very, very crucial. If you don't get that right, you're going to run into a couple of concrete walls. So um, manganese, now the latest is that kids with HPU lose all minerals in smaller amounts. And so we use uh, a product called Micro Minerals. Uh, that these are monoatomically suspended minerals in a watery solution that is very, very easily absorbed. And HPU patients do dramatically better when we introduce that early on. And the biotin is a huge issue. There's some sublingual biotins which the kids love if they can tolerate a tiny amount of sugar. You know, otherwise, um, my friend Jonathan Wright in Seattle, his, his clinic, uh, it's called the Tahoma Clinic Pharmacy. They have a biotin without binders and fillers. It's a small tablet um, that doesn't have anything in it other than biotin that has been ideal for the kids. You have to crush it with mortar and pistol, like many of you are used to. Then after breakfast, now the oils. Yeah? So I use evening primrose oil my favorite for the ghee works very well and borage and black corn oil for the omega-6 fatty acid. Now, uh, one thing that is not commonly known in the U.S., when you at the same time take a mineral and an oil, who, who knows what that makes in the gut? What's that called? It makes soap. And soap is a non-absorbable item. Yeah? And many of you give your kids like a multiple supplement and the, the fish oil right with it, you're making soap in the gut and you don't get either of the two. Yeah? This is really overlooked in the American culture. Yeah? And so you want to separate the minerals with a good bulk of food and then the oils. Yeah? You can also take the oils with the detox agents at night. Sometimes the omega-6 fatty acids are more activating and the fish oil uh, increases parasympathetic tone, which really for these kids, they should have fish oil all day long, you know, in addition to this. And, and remember that there is a misconception of a conflict with omega-6 and omega-3. There isn't. We need both. You know? And with these kids, it's the exception that in addition to large amounts of fish oil, they also need omega-6 oils. This is not instead. You know? And then, I like to give the B6 at bedtime and we use usually a mix of P5P and B6. Now we know that the, the uh, Codex Alimentarius is coming into action now where all the vitamins are going to be taken off the market and blah, blah, blah. And the first thing that the FDA is targeting now, we heard that from inside sources, is P5P. So P5P will not be available in a few weeks even. Yeah? 
that's um, the first strike and they're going to do the same as they did in Europe. They're going to take one thing away here and one thing over there so nobody speaks up yeah, until there's nothing left. But it's going to be done just like Hitler did it with, you know, first he took out the communists and of course the Christians sat there and said, you know, well, and the Jews sat there and said, well, I'm glad it's not us, you know. And then he took the, the priests of, uh, within the Protestant thing and took those out and gassed them. And the Catholics stood there and kind of said, well, you know, sure, the Protestants, I mean, they had that coming for a long time, right? And then they took out the heads of the Catholic Church and gassed them. And then the Protestants said, well, they did it to us. They didn't speak up, so now we don't want to speak up either. And then they took the Jews and they took all of them, you know. And I see a similar thing happens in Europe now with the, with the Codex. It's, it's a few supplements every day that are taken off the market. So the people that are affected by this are always just small groups. One over here, one over there, they don't communicate with each other because they think it's just us. And so the plan here for the US is the same, uh, to do a few supplements at a time. Uh, and so the people that are not affected by it say, well, it's just those few people over there, and it's going to be those few people over there, and then over there. I do have the inside information that that's the plan. And so P5P is going to be the first one. But the good news is, good news is that Tapan Audio showed us clear evidence that we have an enzyme in the gut that cleaves off the P5P, the phosphorus, and makes it into the B6 and is actually absorbed as a straight cheap B6 and has to be phosphorylated anyway then to use it again. So the whole P5P idea is a myth that uh, P5P is easier absorbed or, or better, it's just a lot more expensive. So that they're taking that off first off the market is really their, their mistake, they're going to make it easier for us. Now, I know there are some kids that are more allergic to the old B6 and there be, can be some reasons to use P5P. But in general, I've gone in the last few months to just use straight B6 since finding that out. There's just a difference in the dynamic. P5P is great to give in the evening and tends to help people dream better, sleep better, especially in grown-ups, but also in children. The B6 works better if you give it in the morning. It seems to be the only difference. And B6 is dirt cheap. You get like a bottle with 100 tablets for like $2 at Walmart or, or Costco. You know, and the P5P, the same amount would cost you $30. So just be aware of that. So um, magnesium you can give in, in different forms. I also like magnesium uh, malate uh, that, that Lee Cowden has in, in, in the company that he sort of advises. And uh, interesting that we found in HPU a high need of calcium that surprised me. Um, when we looked in the P of the HPU patients, and looked at all the minerals that peeing out, they pee out huge amounts of calcium. And so calcium was at least in my world under, undervalued. Um, if there's psychiatric symptoms, <laughs> i.e. all autistic children, we also give, use niacin. In autistic children, we use niacinamide. It's not as good, but it's an important ingredient. And then uh, taurine is an absolute must in all the, all, all the kids. You know, taurine, has a, a, a huge function in HPU. Um, Taurine is involved in many functions in the brain. You'll be used for seizure control, but it's also important to make bile. It's part of the, the bile salts. And the way we're excreting uh, neurotoxins from molds and from Lyme is via the bile. And it can only be done by turning on the bile flow with taurine. Yeah, so it's, it's the most important. On the long run, while we're working at detox program, the most important uh, agent. Um, other consideration, I'll go quick now. One is the zinc copper kind of discussion. What we found, usually people have enough internal copper stores for about four or five months, but zinc knocks out copper. And after about four or five months, many of the kids become copper deficient. Copper is very important for the kids because it's involved in dopamine synthesis. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter for language development and motor development. And so you cannot overlook a copper deficiency. And, and, and there's a myth in American nutritional medicine that everybody's copper toxic. That's completely in conflict with the scientific literature. 
it shows that our daily need for copper is somewhere between 3 and 4 milligrams and what we're getting in the nutrition and the exposures and the drinking water is about 0.5 milligrams. Yeah? So what, what has been mistaken in the copper area is when we have Lyme disease, the, the enzymes needed to fight Lyme disease are all copper defending enzymes and when the immune system shoots off its ammunition there's a lot of displaced copper which shows up on the surface in the hair analysis, in the, the urine challenge test and copper comes out everywhere. This is used up oxidized copper used up by the immune system. On a deep level we're depleted of it. You know? And to recycle the copper the easiest is to do it with a good vitamin C and I hear that Gary Gordon has the best vitamin C in the world now so I don't know if it's true but it may be true. And um, you need a reduction, reductive agents that add electrons into the system to recycle the copper and we use homeopathic copper in a 4x solution, a dilution and that seems to be the best way of dealing with copper to give vitamin C and homeopathic copper that helps to recycle the oxidized copper and bring it back into the tissues where it's needed. Um, good. Um, garlic is the holy grail of Lyme treatment. I'm not going to go into that but Organic high allein freeze dried garlic releases 13 milligrams of allicin. There are several products out there of stabilized allicin, and they all contain allicin in the area of micrograms, not milligrams. Yeah? This is milligrams, one capsule, organic freeze dried garlic. Um, so please consider that. Yeah? We don't need to the industrial kind of clean up garlic if you can have the real nature product. Um, uh, BioPure uh, has that and there's a company called BII that has it. Um, it's a phenomenal product and, and the interesting thing is that you know, most ASD children are sulfur sensitive and can't tolerate anything with sulfur in it or at least not well. Once you treat KPU they all become sulfur tolerant. All the ones that I've treated so far and they start craving garlic. You know, you put it in the food and give them two choices, the side with the garlic and the one without, and take the one with the garlic. But you need to, we use little sprinkles at first and then increase it every day with every meal. And they become wonderful sulfur like patients that it fills their sulfur stores, garlic detoxes virtually every toxin known to humans and it kills Lyme disease. You know, there's several studies out now that shows that the allicin from garlic is a very, very effective antispirochetal drug. And if, if you're confused, if, if you take garlic or any agent that may kill mold or Lyme disease and you have a feeling the child reacts to it is bad for you, take the pulse test. The COCA pulse test, I take you through this, you establish what the normal resting pulse rate is for your child. You have to measure many times throughout the day because they could, if you have a disturbed sleeping location, the pulse in the morning is already fast because the child is already reactive to the sleeping location. So you need to take it several times. The lowest pulse that you can find in your child is the only one you can use. If it's in that state, you give it a few sprinkles of garlic and if the pulse rate doesn't go up, the child is not allergic to garlic. No matter what the reaction is that happens afterwards. These are, this is how you can simply distinguish a Herxheimer reaction from an allergic reaction. Yeah. In a Herxheimer reaction, the pulse does not go up. Yeah. If the pulse goes up, it's an allergic reaction. Good. Um. Now, uh, metal detox, we do different things. I take you through this. Um, the, the new kit on the block is microsilica. It's a silica molecule spiked with sulfur hydro groups. For each molecule of this, you get an effect approximately 50 times as strong as the equivalent amount of DMPS or DMSA. It's a new kit on the block. You can detox the kits now without any side effects. I've never seen a kit not do well on this. This is a phenomenal new product um, designed by a brilliant biochemist in Colorado. It's a little powder, has a little scoop in it, 100 milligrams. Um, the dosages are here in a grown up. I give usually four doses a day. It makes us beautiful with water uh, or juice. If the kid can drink juice, it's best with juice. A little acidity is, is best to dissolve it better, otherwise it takes a little bit. 
but you just shake it up in whatever liquid you get the kid to drink. And in, a, in an autistic child, I easily use half a scoop twice a day. And as you will see in a moment, if it goes through the rapid accelerator of detox, when the KPU treatment starts working, they need more. They need up to 10, 15 doses a day for two, three days in a row, and they're through the Herxheimer reaction, they're through the detox reaction. Everything else has become less important since we have this thing. It has replaced DMPS, has replaced DMSA, has replaced EDTA, has replaced Cruella, it has replaced um, Zeolite, it has replaced everything that we've known so far to be true. It's just simply better and smoother and more elegant and gets the job done quicker and really works. I know we have OSR now. OSR um, is quite specific in detoxing the central nervous system, but it looks to us that the kids are so toxic elsewhere in the body, the OSR never reaches into the brain. It binds to mercury and lead wherever it finds it on the way. It never gets there. OSR is a late agent. It's beautiful to give. Once you detox a kid for two years with the most effective method, then the OSR starts becoming very effective. OSR has a great synergistic effect with the microsilica and can be given together. So this one, uh, by the way, this talk, is going to be on Tammy's website so you can look at all the numbers and stuff because it's a little different from what you have in your handout and I, I make sure that it's available. It's also going to be on my website, it's klinghub.org and you can download it or do whatever you want with it. Um, I know um, I got now, I don't know, 17 minutes left so I'm going to now go to the most important part. This is now what we talk about now is the reason why HPU and KPU isn't the first thing that every physician in the world knows about. It's the healing crisis that happened. When you start knocking off cadmium and nickel and mercury and lead from these different structures in the body where it's been attached to for years. So you watch out for it when you start this protocol two to six weeks into the treatment. And then there's going to be sudden waves of it months into the treatment. Do not underestimate it. Use the strongest available detox agent during that time. And this is when I pull out my old DMSA. Um, I use Kemet and crush it up. You know, when people have insurance, if they don't have insurance, I use a compounded form of it. And these are huge doses I use for two, three days in a row to get the kids through their crisis when they start detoxing, when they start herxing. And then uh, I still use transdermal DMPS. I still love it. I also give it IM in the kids because sometimes the only thing you're going to get into them when they're in crisis is an intramuscular shot. Now, no matter how much the kid flails and is aggressive and all over the place, you can always get an IM shot in. If it refuses anything, rectal, oral or so, you can always get an IM shot in. That's what I love DMPS for. It's the most reliable agent in that way. Three milligrams per kilogram body weight. And that I do sometimes in the crisis twice a day. So I give much, much higher doses from anything that is discussed about in our cycles against the backdrop of the KPU treatment. Because these crises, when they come, when they start knocking off waves of metals, they're serious and you want to cover the kid with everything that you can. And, and this has been a mistake that everybody made in the field. As some of you know, I use muscle testing and it has guided me in this to realize that these are huge amounts of metals that are coming out. We had like I did some DMPS shots uh, in that phase and kids, little, little four-year-olds have released up to 2,000 micrograms of mercury in just one single shot. Not, not 20 or 30 where we thought it was high, 2,000. Yeah? So these are other dimensions. Beautiful to document with hair analysis. After a crisis, yeah, we know that the proximal inch of hair represents the last four weeks. And I, I get into the hair analysis because that's the most fascinating part of this whole story for me. Um, so we do different things, everything we know for detox. I like a German agent called Zinc DTPA. It's a wonderful, safe way of detoxing. It can also be given uh, intramuscularly, but it's not available in the US. I use it in my European patients. But the big kit on the block is this one here. You know, it's really the, the biggest thing. Chlorella and metal binding, there's lots of literature on it. I'm always attacked that there's no literature. You can read it up on the website. 
Um, this is a study we did on cilantro. Basically, um, the, the, the red bars here are the increases in metal excretion just with 15 drops of cilantro tincture. Now that's, uh, that it's, it's not just any cilantro, it really is the biopure cilantro that's put through an energizer, it's put through a laser treatment and through a magnetic field treatment and through a rife type treatment. Um, the nickel goes up, cadmium goes up, cesium goes up, barium goes up, and the mercury goes up quite dramatically, palladium goes up, titanium goes up. So it mobilizes pretty much everything you don't want in there at a very, 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 very low price. You know, this, is, um, this is 20 patients, you know, and that's all the effort I made in that. And because it's cheap, people can't get this idea. Many of you, the first thing you will have forgotten when you get home is the cilantro, yeah, because it's cheap and it, it doesn't sound like much. They have a great cilantro soup here in the hotel, by the way. They do. So, can you use a frequent cofactor in heavy metal toxicity, Lyme disease, many if not most neurological illnesses, and KPU is correctly diagnosed or recommended substitution of supplements included in the treatment of any chronic illness outcome can be dramatically improved. Now I'm getting observations. I'm going to skip this part. Uh, some literature. Um, now some cases. This was a five-year-old with red syndrome. I don't know how many of you treat red or have red children. Has not been able to walk for three years. She was in a wheelchair when she presented. No language, frequent seizures once a day, you know, three times a week minimum. She's been on a dentite protocol for two years and slightly improved with it. So she presented in a wheelchair, somebody bent over, collapsed, no eye contact, constant stems, you know, the kind of thing that, that red children do, and the grinding of the teeth, it's driving me nuts. My mom does it with his dentures because they don't fit. And, and it's just, I'm so sensitized to it. I've been, uh, another red child comes in, you know, in the, to the thing with the hands and the grinding of the teeth, it's just awful. And in, in, in that case, it's not worms. Otherwise, you know, grinding of the teeth, first thing you think of is worms, but in red children, usually it isn't worms, it's just part of the illness. So, uh, she was positive in KPU test. Um, remember, anything over 30 is considered a, a severe condition. So we worked the KPU protocol. We gave her homeopathic IGF-1, which is a little trick that I developed. It's fantastic for red syndrome. Uh, to get the muscle strength back up. I use a Japanese treatment for RET, which is Aldopa at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. It's a custom compound, it's a sublingual lozenge, works absolutely beautiful. Mom calls after six weeks, there's increased seizure activity, she's worse, everything is worse in her, which is what I expected, so I'm no longer defeated by that. You know, in the past, we stopped the kids on the KPU treatment. That's the exact point I'm trying to point out here. And so I said, great. She got more seizures, fantastic. So, so we added 100 milligrams of microsilica three times a day uh, to the protocol. Uh, she also gets DMSA every three hours. I give her DMSA, a pretty high dose. After one week, there's no more seizures. You stop the DMSA, keep her on the microsilica. Next four and a half months, the kid makes an 80% improvement, according to mom. Yeah. So I saw her. This was just a few weeks ago, um, a few months ago, recently. Um, she walks in, I didn't recognize, I mean, I've seen her only once before. You know, like after you see so many kids, it's like, I can't tell them apart you know, anymore. I mean, and, and, and those of you who are my patients, I, I apologize to that. And it's sort of, I, I feel a basic love for all of them, and it's like pretty much the same. And so, she walks in my pl I didn't recognize her because you know I, I only knew the slump over little kid you know in a wheelchair kind of but didn't look at me and suddenly there is a shining little star kind of that just comes and runs up to me gives me a hug I mean you know those moments and they're just heartbreaking in one way and beautiful in another and so a uh, re response absolutely beautiful mom couldn't believe it wheelchair <laughs> is in the storage unit at this time you know um, and yeah. And uh, March 9, I started on a Lyme protocol because I tested with muscle testing. And uh, two months later, uh, we do the Western blood and it's positive for Lyme. And so we are right now have her on my Lyme treatment. 
and the kid is very well. And you know, red children are not supposed to respond. You know, what's there's a MACP2 gene mutation and is unchangeable, it's cast in concrete, and yet that's not what we see. So I find the whole genetic angle has a lot of psychological dangers built into it. You know, that you fall in the trap of genetic cement uh, rather than trusting in God and, and miracles and that we don't really know shit about the body, you know. <laughs> what scientists of friends of mine in Germany discover is that almost for every defective gene that we have, we have a backup gene in some unknown regions of the DNA uh, that just needs to be activated. You know? And in the most hopeless situations, you can trust that somewhere is a backup gene that you can call forth somehow. We just don't know yet how to do that, but it often happens spontaneously and we just stick with it. So here's another one. I just have these two cases that I wanted to show. There was a seven-year-old autistic boy. He was, you know, practically all over the place, aggressive, no language, uncooperative. You know, I mean, I developed a way of muscle testing these kids, you know, so I'm, I'm the only practitioner, I think, who has a system that can, has a wireless setup where it can just be put this little piece of plastic into the, onto the kit, so you have to strap it onto the kit, and the kit can run as far away as the wall on the other side, and we can test them with my system. It has allowed me to make great progress with these kinds of kits that you can't pin down on a table or on a chair for an exam. So the kid is running around in the office, all over the, dismantling my office, and fortunately everything in my office is replaceable. So there's nothing there that you know I'll be missing if it's gone. And so that was my first impact. You know, he had uh, what's typical uh, hyper and hypo segmented skin section. That's another trigger that makes you think HPU. You know, these large brown areas or or white areas on the skin. Um, it's, or, or hyperpigmentation, or, or grown-ups that get a lot of brown spots when they get older, always think HPU. So we ordered the lab, was posit highly positive for, for KPU, and then, uh, as I say here in a moment, was phase two, it, and a few weeks later, we do Western blood, was highly positive for, uh, for, for uh, Lyme and for Bartonella. Um, maybe I show the... Can, can I go back on this one? I, I hope I just want to go forward and, and show something. Uh, that's not the same kid, but this is what we saw on the kid. This is Bartonella when you see this on the kid. These, these uh, uh, stretch marks that don't belong in that place. You know? They don't belong on the side of the, of the hip. Okay. So. Um, we did a phase one, is when I do my HPU protocol and, and start the detox with it. Um, phospholipid exchange, I, I will start considering uh, Gary Gordon's new zeolite. Um, uh, Gary has done enough of his research, he's been in this field longer than me, and uh, I think it will be an important extra piece. I, as you will see, I use green clay. For me, zeolite is a glorified clay. Yeah? It is, it is a clay. However, it has properties that normal clay doesn't have. So it is like a, a super clay if you want. And since clay is already part of my program, I'm very open to substitute or add the zeolite to it. Um, so we started on, and as expected, he has severe bouts of anger, depression. He attacks his mom twice. Never did that before, starting after five weeks. Mom, of course, calls me and says, Dietrich, you need to stop the protocol. It's not working. Yeah, that's a unique response moms give me when people are on the HPU protocol. A couple of weeks into the protocol, that response comes. We can't go forward with this. It is just too bad. Yeah? That sort of a thing. And all that means for me, we don't have enough detox on board. We need to crank it up. We need to crank it up not just a little bit by degrees. A quantum leap. You know, a DMPS shot every five minutes. I'm exaggerating. You know? But it's like... It, it, you have to think in a whole new dimension of detox, of really everything that you know about detox, you do it 20-fold just for three or four days and you'll be through the crisis. That's sort of where everybody's got hung up on this. So anyway, so we endured it. 
It lasted for a couple of weeks, then the boy becomes unusually peaceful and follows instructions for the first time. Seizures have completely stopped. The hair analysis now shows high levels of lead and mercury that had never any before. This is a kid who had probably 20 hair analyses. He had the porphyrin test in France yeah, probably five times. Never showed no, no pre copper porphyrin, no copper porphyrin. None of the tests of heavy metals ever showed any excretion of metals. Now on the KPU protocol, he has an astronomical high level of mercury. I tried to get it into my power. I don't still know how to put scan something in with a lay, with the um, scanner. I know how to do that, but then to take that picture and put it in the PowerPoint. If any one of you can show me that in a break, I'd be eternally grateful. You have all these. I live in the middle of Microsoft and there's all these people that can show me how to create a de novo computer program, but none of them can show me how to put a scanned picture into a PowerPoint. So, would you? We do that today. Yeah, you show me how to do that. Okay, then, then I start phase two. You know, now, now he's stable on the HPU protocol. Now I start my Lyme treatment. And usually we use quintessence. Uh, quintessence is, is a product uh, from BioPure, where they took Stephen Booner's research um, with his different herbs, and then I tested it on probably 200 kids or so, the different herbs, and found that for Lyme disease in kids, there's just five herbs that really stick out. It's similar to what Lee has done in, in, in other ways, and this is a similar idea, it's just they're different herbs, and we, we do the same thing, we put them through a laser process, an electromagnetic field process, an electric field process and, and various other things to energize the herbs and then all put together in, in certain proportions and there's a synergistic mix that is just absolutely fantastic and easy for treating Lyme disease, Bartonella and Babesia in all these kids. It's a one shot kind of fixes it all protocol. Y you can easily add these herbs to it if you're familiar with the use of them and his are described very beautifully in, in the website from, from the company. Um, so there's many ways of skinning the cat. Um, however, this has been the easy way. That it's a good tasting tincture. Um, then my, my treatment always includes some artemisinin if the kid is old enough to swallow tiny, tiny capsules. Artemisinin is the world's leading treatment for malaria and a wonderful treatment for Babesia, which most of these kids have. Uh, and so I use high, high doses of it. There are five caps, three times a day. This is 15 caps a day, two days each week. This is internationally the published treatment for malaria. And I do that every week, not just once, as you would do for malaria. I do it every week for about 12 rounds of it. And then um, I add the rhizoles. Rhizoles are ozonated plant oils. It's the plant peroxides. You can put that in the bath water and have phenomenal effects just by having absorption through the skin. Uh, you can put it in an enema, it works beautiful that way. Um, you can rub it under the axilla and in the area where the lymphatic takes up a lot of plant oils or you can take it internally. And it's sort of published in various places on my website, so dosing and so forth. But Rhizol Zeta and Rhizol Gamma are the main ones. Zeta is the one that has a number of antiviral herbs in it, they're ozonated antiviral herbs and so this one is more for the brain related symptoms and gamma is for the gut related symptoms. This is how we get the measles in the gut under control and the herpes viruses in the brain and the Lyme spirochetes and the Bartonella and all the other bugs. Uh, so in a very, very simple and safe way. Um, so this kid, six weeks into phase two, starts saying his first words. He's interested, first time real eye contact with the parents since he's 18 months old. He's making good progress over the next year while working this protocol. Then he takes, and then we give him a, a three-way appliance. Yeah, I managed up here somewhere that he had a, yeah, he had a very narrow upper dental arch. His teeth are very kind of, you know, squished together. So we give him a dental appliance. It's a, a dentist friend in LA who did that for me. Uh, and he makes a major, major step forward. And, uh, you know, at age nine, He's still in a special school, in special ed, but he's completely communicating. He's completely, if you would see him here and interact with him, you would not know that this kid was ever a severe Lyme kid, a severe autistic kid. You would not know it. You know? And I have no doubt that this kid will make a complete recovery. I got him a little bit late, you know, with seven, seven years old. 
I like to see the kids you know, when they're four. You know, when they're four, the miracles are quick. You know, the, the older the kid is, the longer the, the magic takes. I know my time is up, but I want to see there's a few more things I want to just show you just briefly. So, this one here, I just, every one of you should know this study, but it's, it's, it's a study where they, you know, what's listed here is the number of amalgam fillings that the mother had during the pregnancy. And what's listed here is the amount of mercury that the kid excretes in the hair two years later. Yeah? And this is the, the group of normal kids, they excrete successfully mercury in the hair. This is the autistic group, they cannot mobilize mercury, cannot get it out. And here is now the main point I'm trying to make for the whole day. When you put the people on KPU, this group changes to this group. The difference between those two groups is the KPU treatment. I have not seen an exception to it. In grown-ups, I had so many grown-up uh, blind patients. We look at the hair analysis, there's no metals coming out. Every damn other physician has told them, you're not metal toxic, that's not your problem. We've got to treat you with antibiotics. The moment I put them on KPU, four months into it, they have huge amounts of mercury and lead and nickel and cadmium coming out in their hair. They were the mercury ones, they were the toxic ones, they just were the non excretors and with that they were the ones in danger. And that breaks the ice in the grown-up with Lyme disease and it breaks the ice in the autistic with Lyme disease. At a cost of the healing crisis, when they start mobilizing, they start mobilizing and it's like a wildfire that's sometimes hard to control. Um, so then, you know, we do the normal uh, principles of uh, ASD treatment, the things that have really kind of crystallized out for us. Of course, the gluten-free, casein-free diet or, or the SCD, but we, do, we have a gut biofilm protocol. It's green clay, and the one thing I want to point out is silica. Silica is the under, esti underestimated one thing they have to do with every patient, with, ev with you, with the kids. So, Silica is the main structural molecule in the matrix. The matrix is that, that place between the blood vessels and the cells where all the nutrients have to tra be transported through that. It is the place where the toxic metals are stored, the environmental toxins. And it needs a silica and very structural. It makes the matrix into a crystal that, that is electric conductive, where everything works 10 times, 100 times faster. It's done with silica. And the product that works is called Biosil. Um, it's usually in health food stores, but not always. Um, you have to Google it. Uh, Biosil is has a, it's a choline-bound silica that is taken up 100% absorbed and has a phenomenal effect in speeding everything up that you've ever heard about. You know? And the grown-up dose is 20 drops a day. It has unfortunately a bad taste to it. And so in kids, you can rub it in the soles of the feet. You know? The natural way for us people to absorb silica is by walking barefoot in the dirt. You know, that's where we used to get our silica. And if you're not doing that for a couple of hours every day, you need silica. And you can rub it in the feet of the kid when they sleep at night. That's the best way of giving it. But you can put a few drops in the food. And it's phenomenal how that accelerates detox and everything, every other aspect. You know, the rest, you know, the core pieces really is the folinic acid, the different forms of B12, and the dimethylglycine with the muscle testing it really has emerged as, as, as the core piece of the methylation cycle kind of issues. Everything else seems to be secondary. And then uh, Alenia, for the medical guys amongst you, is the miracle drug in, in our field. Alenia is a new, fairly new antiparasitic uh, that treats all of the things that are in here, all the parasites that are known, Giardia, Amoebas, H. pylori, all the pathogenic Clostridia in the gut, Babesia, and has some effects on Bartonella and Borrelia. It's like for me, on the first visit, I put most kids, I test them on it, in my muscle testing, if I test for Alenia, they go on Alenia for 20 days. And it has been a miracle, it has been a miracle for, for a lot of kids. Okay. Um, then there's other consideration. We increase mitochondrial activity and ATP with the vacuum. It's a breathing apparatus that I'm not allowed to talk about because the FDA right now cracked down on it. Um, we use the health light. It's a wonderful NASA device that you put on the forehead of the child. It beams 
like 23 centimeters into the brain, it means it reaches almost any region of the brain. It increases metabolic activity in the brain, and especially the forebrain is the part that's where the, where the mirror, uh, mirror neurons are. This is where the dopamine is created. It treats the most essential part of the brain and creates stem cell regeneration, stem cell activity, and draws stem cells into the area to much faster regeneration. Uh, again, it's a device that I shouldn't be talking about, not that it's my company, but the company has been severely attacked because the results have been phenomenal that people have been doing this and whenever that happens, the uh, competition gets, uh, you know, how much damage can you do with light? Well, very, very little. And then, um, in terms of lab, uh, the urine organic acids, I think, have a certain role, the genetic testing with the MEASCO type analysis. I think Amy Yasko is absolutely, she should get a Nobel Prize and everything, but I think Amy Yasko should come after all this, not before and not instead. You know, there is a sequence of it. You should look at the genes that should be an afterthought at the end. It should not be instead of doing these things. Um, now, this is the last thing I want to give you. Find it on the website. But it's a phenomenal, but really new way of skinning the cat, of doing immunotherapy with the kids. You know, all of the kids have deranged immune systems. And this is really something I used to do. I was phenomenal. And then Doris Rapier was lecturing to us in Seattle a few weeks ago and reminded me of that. I said, holy moly, um, I forgot my main treatment. I taught this treatment here 20 years ago. And then I got mentally deranged and forgot. I tell you how I got there. I read an anthropological study that one of my patients sent me about 20 years ago uh, that analyzed why Napoleon lost all his troops in the war with Russia. He, he went to Russia and it was always said, yeah, the winter, the cold, the French weren't prepared. The French had just as cold winters then as the Russians did. That wasn't the issue at all. 95% of Napoleon's troops died of an infection that was unknown what it was. It was called trench fever. On the other side, the Russians, only lost 5% of their troops. And an anthropologist went after this. So he dug up the corpses, found first of all, all out that in the teeth he analyzed, the teeth for PCR stains, and found that they were all died of Bartonella. Bartonella is one of the current co-infections of Lyme disease, cat scratch disease. That was the real cause of their death. And then he went after why, why didn't the Russians die? They were just mingling with each other, fighting with each other, they hit the same exposures. The Russian general was General Kozakov, who was an avid student of homeopathy. And Kozakov <laughs> did exactly what I'm telling you now. And Doris, I think I give this as a little thing for you also, because Theron Randolph, the five-in-one mix of diluting allergens and coming up with an antidote, was already done by Kozakov. This is 1818, we're talking. So, it's almost 200 years ago. And so what Kozakov did, he had the, the soldiers spit into their jar. They had their little bottle you know, with water with the little cup on it. And they had to, every morning, this was, he killed, soldiers were killed that didn't do that. They had to spit, <coughs> spit in the cup and kind of go, <coughs> and put their snot and everything they had into the cup. And then add, estimate, they add five times as much water to it, shake it up, Empty it, now it was a little different, empty it out, add water in, and they had like four of these steps, and then drink the water once a day. That was it. He lost 5% of his troops. Napoleon lost 95% of the troops. I was fascinated when I read that, and then, you know, lectured by Tan Randolph, and then was we Bill Ray kind of asked how you exactly do this. So here's what we do today. It's listed here very carefully. Basically, you, 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 scrape the tongue of the child and collect as much goop as you can. And you add a little water to it so it doesn't stick to the wall, so it's a liquid. You mix, stir it up, mix it up. And then you add five times as much water to it, and this becomes your H1 solution. H stands for hexa. The total is six parts. You know, the Greek word for, for six is hexa. So they're called H, H solution, dilutions. And you basically do six steps of that and end up with an H6, and of that, the child gets four drops six times a day with phenomenal results and improvement. 
in terms of the immune modulation in relationship to the infections that they all have. They start behaving clearer, thinking clearer. They do go through some Herxheimer reactions a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks into it. Yeah? So this is going to be listed on Amy Duncan, Duncan's, uh, Tammy Duncan's website. That she's going to have this in her computer and I asked her to put it on the website. So she can just copy it from there, how to do that. Yeah. There's a little bit of a weird step in it. Somewhere in there I use, uh, instead of water, I use the matrix electrolyte solution. Uh, again, I'm, I'm advertising here Biopure. I'm sorry you know, for, for not being clean in that way, but um, I don't know any other product that does that. The electrolyte is a hyperselenic solution which kills all the bugs in there. And we do want the bugs dead for two reasons. One, when a killer bug osmotically it ruptures the cell membrane and all the contents of the bugs are now part of my solution rather than just the outer cell wall. And, and secondly, I don't want anything to grow in my solution because the kid's going to use it for a long time. And so step number four, uh, I use electrolyte solution and the next step is again with water. And so the end solution has one-fifth of a salty solution and it has a pleasant, nice, soft, salty taste that the kids love. And so it ends up being a nice tasting product that is free. All you need is one empty dropper bottle that is not contaminated. And it makes the most powerful autonozo, as we call it in homeopathy, or most powerful healing remedy that you will ever have given your child. It beats anything I've seen from classical homeopathy, anything I've seen from diluted uh, 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 toxins uh, and chemicals, anything I've seen from, from giving any other thing diluted. It's the perfect remedy for this patient. And I, I usually recommend every six weeks or so to make a fresh mother tincture because the bugs change. As you do this, the immune system changes, the bugs change. And that's really the greatest gift I want to give to you is this particular recipe. It's been absolutely magical for the, for the kids since I started doing it again. Sorry for going over time. It was nice. Thank you.